Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and get started, I guess. Um, right off the bat, anybody have questions before we get into, into some stuff today? Okay, so a um, couple things. I'm gonna try and provide some extra credit um, opportunities for the class. That, th this, that tends to be my kind of way of doing an implicit curve. Um, so just be on the lookout for those. Most likely, for example, there will be more than 100 points available for participation grade, potentially for some of the projects as well. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. And um, as far as the projects go, um, they're kind of revamped. Well, not just kind of, they are revamped for this semester. I, I put actually a lot of work, probably unnecessarily, but it was fun into doing that. And so like really don't cheat because it probably won't even work. Um, and it'll be pretty obvious if you're using something from some previous semester. Um, as far as attendance goes, like it's like it's not required. Um, you can, you know, if you prefer to watch the recording later, that's fine. Um, but um, obviously, if you attend live, you're going to be able to ask me questions, which is uh, probably a really, you know, beneficial thing. Um, and if you attend, if you just watch a recording later, just like still do the worksheet too. Um, okay. So that's that's it as far as logistic stuff. Um, I'm gonna just quickly go through some of the last slides of, of lecture one and then we'll, we'll hop into lecture two. So um, yeah, I just wanted to, to provide just a, a little bit of a glimpse into some general architecture like uh, uh, developments over the past, you know, couple of centuries, right? So I'm sure you've probably heard of these people, Charles Babbage and Ada, Ada Lovelace. Um, I don't know. I think these guys are fascinating. Uh, Charles Babbage effectively was, you know, he, he designed the, the first uh, computer. Um, he never built it. And in fact, to this day, nobody ever has built his, his computer. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but Ada Lovelace is basically the inventor of programming um, because she was able to uh, take this, this design that Babbage had made and actually describe an algorithm to solve some problems, which is pretty cool. So this is, this is the first attempt at a, a computing machine um this is just a part of it actually and uh it's on i think it's actually a, a a modern replica but anyway it's pretty cool um as you can see it's all mechanical um and it has a lot of the same concepts that we'll see in current computer architectures like it had registers and such and it had instructions that you would uh you could um, uh, give it effectively. Um, and it's slow. 33 to 44, 32 digit numbers per minute. Um, so, so Babbage, like he's, he was totally brilliant, but kind of like not at all business savvy. He had tons of money from the uh, British government to develop basically you know they, they, they just wanted to to be able to compute tables very quickly but Babbage was like nah I just want to make a general purpose computer instead 
So he actually designed a, an analytic engine. Um, and it, it has a lot of the same concepts that we'll see, as I said, and like it has a, it had a store, which is kind of like a memory uh, in today's systems. Um, and then it had a, a mill. Oh crap, that's good. Why'd it do that? Uh, which which um, is kind of like your CPU. Um, and it was programmed with punch cards. And so this thing is would be considered turn complete. It did have branches, it did have uh, stuff like that. So it, it it would have it would be turn complete if it were actually made. Problem is um, that he died. Well, that wasn't the only problem. That was a big problem. But he died and he didn't ever develop his machine. Um, during this time, Ada Lovelace, like as I mentioned, had kind of seen this paper in, 19, in 1833 and was like, this seems really useful if he actually developed an algorithm to compute some numbers. I don't remember exactly which sequence it is. Um, and it's not actually clear if this is a viable thing even today with the modern machinery, modern machining, because the, the precision required for all the mechanical parts of this thing are just like, it's, it's just ridiculous. So who knows if it's even possible. Um, it definitely wasn't possible with the machining that they had in the mid 1800s and like steam power. Um, so it's still cool that, that he was able to conceive of this thing. And then also, um, you know, Ada Lovelace was even able to program for it. I don't find the rest of this stuff as interesting as that, but you know, effectively what we realized is let's just make everything um, electric. We, so, you know, um, this, this Harvard Mark I, it was kind of like electromechanical. The, the, the first, you know, real, real success was, was ENIAC uh, and, you know, this, Okay, maybe not real success. It wasn't very reliable, but you know, at least it was the first operational, fully electronic, uh, general-purpose analytical calculator. Um, and yeah, obviously things have have got, come a long way. The big development along the way was that. So with, with ENIAC, you had to program it by like running around and, and changing things on, like changing the literal wires around. Um, and that, that's not very much fun. You had to, um, to reprogram it, it's very difficult, right? You have to literally physically go in and, and change, the, change the machine itself. And if you wanted to, for example, do out of order execution, well, good luck. That's gonna require, require human intervention. So luckily they realized this is a bad idea and von Neumann, Eckert, Malti, I don't know how you actually say this, decided, well, let's just store the program as data in the computer. And that is how modern computers obviously work. And thank goodness for that, um, because if they didn't, I don't know. I think we'd, we'd be in a world of hurt. I wouldn't like that world. Um, so that's, that was the biggest development. IBM got into the game. They had tons of, um, you know, before, before they got into the game, they were making all sorts of like mechanic, electromechanical stuff, uh, you know, sorters, card sorters and such. Um, and they were making tons of money on that. And then they're like, oh, computers should, should probably look into that. And the rest is kind of history. They did have a problem though. And that's that all of their lines were really very like not compatible. Um, they had their own instruction sets. They had all their own different peripherals. They had all their different like assemblers and compilers and everything. And it was just a total mess. Like if 
you would have to basically reprogram, uh, rewrite your program if you wanted to, to move to a different um, line of computer. So uh, Amdahl, who we'll talk about fairly extensively in the next few, few lectures, um, um, and a few others wrote a paper that basically um, defined an ISA, an instruction set architecture. So this is a compatibility compat compatibility layer. Uh, it's kind of an it's an abstraction um, that allows the the programmer to not have to worry about the implementation of the like instructions. Um, and obviously we inherited this, thank goodness. Um, ISAs are, you know, pretty pretty core to what we do now. Nobody actually even knows how processors work pretty much anymore. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody, but there's like, you know, 20 people at Intel and AMD and that's it. Um, but yeah, it, it basically, and we'll talk about ISAs a bit later, but but the, the development of an I of the first ISA is like this. Thank goodness for this. If we didn't have that, that'd be a total disaster. You think it's bad having to port everything to the M1? Imagine doing that for every every uh, for every single manufacturer. Um, pictures, pictures. I don't really care. These aren't as interesting. You can look at them later if you would like. Um, okay, so. Um, Sorry for having to go through those a little bit faster than, than uh, normal, but somebody invaded our classroom last week, so what can I do? Okay, let's get into performance metrics. So what stuff do you maybe care about in your computer? Just go ahead and shout out anything that you care about. Speed, okay, well, that, that's on there for sure. What else? Memory. Memory, okay. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of other stuff on here too. Any, any others that maybe aren't on here? RGB, yeah, of course. I mean, that's the most important thing. That's what makes it go fast. Low cost, yeah. Any other novel things? For me, is it red? Um, legitimately, I, I think that I, man, I, I justify the price of this thing, like at least $100 worth of the price of this thing just because it's red. Um, you know, maybe you care about it being good looking or that its weight is really light. This thing is really light, it's amazing. Um, size, this might matter if you know, you were on the airplane a lot. Probably aren't anymore, but whatever. Um, RGB, MKBHD recommended maybe. Um, obviously, the, the most important metric that we care about is FPS for Fortnite. Um, if you're 12. Good webcam for Zoom. This is actually like a real concern now. Um, USB-C, you know, all sorts of stuff, price. Um, there's, there's plenty of things that consumers tend to think about as far as what they want in a computer. Um, but honestly, we don't care about most of these in this class. Um, we do care about some of these things, obviously. Um, mainly stuff like speed and maybe price. Um, but we're gonna, you know, it's just interesting to think about these different different things, right? Um, okay, so let's talk about some actual metrics that we're gonna be looking at in this class. Uh, the first is latency. So latency, it's the most common metric in all of computer architecture. Pretty much if we're talking about anything, it's gonna be in terms of latency. And it's just the, it's just a fancy way of saying runtime. So, you know, if you're at a party and you're talking about, oh, my computer's so slow, don't say that. That sounds lame. 
say, oh, the latency is very high, right? I, I, can't, I can't do anything. Um, speed, we're gonna define as just the inverse of latency. We'll get to how to actually use this a little bit later. Um, and whenever we talk about performance, most likely what we're talking about is latency. Um, obviously, if latency goes down, that's a good thing. And if, you know, therefore, uh, since speed is the inverse, you know, more speed, the better. Um, now, it's important to be precise with how we just talk about latency. Latency only applies to a certain or particular task, right? We, we can't say something like, oh, this CPU has, uh, has low latency or high latency. That's not a thing. What we can say is that a specific application has a latency on a particular CPU. Um, and this is what we're really gonna care about. Um, we can't say stuff like, you know, for example, right? When, when manufacturers come out with stuff like even just reporting the gigahertz of a processor, it's pretty useless. Cause it could just be that like, they, they made a really, really dumb instruction set architecture, you know, with five operations or six operations. Um, and so then you're gonna, you're gonna have to, your binary size is gonna be huge because there's so many instructions that you have to run just to do simple, basic uh, operations. Um, but they can be like, oh, it's like eight gigahertz. What does that matter? It's still probably slow. Okay, um, so let's think about some reasons why this might matter. First of all, obviously, like application responsiveness is is a, is a big thing. Um, anytime that somebody's waiting on a computer, like they care about the latency of that particular task, right? GUIs uh, matter a lot um, because you know if it freezes. Your users like you know really mad. Um, games latency matters. Um, Got to get that high FPS. Um, internet services maybe right. You don't want your page load to be taking forever, like Trailhead or something. Um, Sometimes though, we actually have constraints given, us to, given to us by the real world. So we can kind of categorize these things under real-time application. An example would be anti-lock braking systems. This we would, we, we would describe as like hard real-time, right? If your ABS takes another 200 milliseconds to decide to spin one of your tires, you might crash. <laughs> So that's probably not good. Um, however, you know, multimedia applications, you know, if if you if you have to buffer or, or lose a couple frames on your video, it's probably not the end of the world. But it's still um, a constraint given to us by the real world, you know, by our eyes looking at this thing and being like, oh, it 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 froze for a second. Um, so we do have to consider it. Um, and I mean, obvious, like this is, this is the thing that we really, really care about, right? Gotta, gotta get that FPS up. Um, so next metric that we're gonna look at is speed up. This is just a ratio. We're gonna find that like most of the metrics are that are interesting are ratios or products um, and it's just a ratio of two two different latencies you put the old one on top uh, in the numerator you put the new one in the denominator and you know so uh if the speed up is greater than one then it means that 
the oh crap uh the the new latency would have had to be smaller so we get a performance increase if it's less than one then we get a performance decrease we don't have like speed up and slow down we just call it all speed up um, so you might see a speed up that's like 0.5 and you should know that that's a performance degradation you know that's not a good thing um so yeah, here, here's just an example of that. Say we have machine A, it's two times faster than machine B. So latency of A is gonna be just latency of B over two, right? Half of the latency of B. Um, and so we can we can pretty simply compute this speed up. You just, you know, plug in the the values and uh, cancel out, you know, latency B and you get a half, which is 0.5. It is important to, to note this terminology of speed up of B relative to A. So we always talk about the new thing relative to the old thing. Um, so just be aware of that. Okay, question so far, gone through two metrics. Okay, so speed up and you know any ratio metric um, allow us to compare different systems without having to deal with absolute units. You know, it's a lot easier to say stuff like doubling the clock speed will give a speed up of two x, um, and we don't we don't even have to know about the concrete latency, right? We don't have to know anything about the actual latency. It's way easier than saying something along these lines, right? Where we have, we were saying, if the program's latency was uh, 1,254 seconds, doubling the clock rate would reduce the latency to 627 seconds. This is like really dumb. Don't don't do this. Just use the speed up. I, I think this is, I mean, this is honestly the power of all ratios across the board, right? We don't talk about you know, it's important to talk about the death rate, for example, with COVID, in addition to the actual numbers, um, because it allows us to understand the, the scale. Um, yeah, because like my brain can't compare large numbers, like larger than 10, but bit much. Okay. The next thing, the next metric is, is throughput. Throughput is just the number of tasks completed per unit of time. So the task can be whatever. It can be bits of data sent uh, from one place to another. It could be number of page uh, responses, you know, query results given back by Google. Um, you know, whatever. And it's independent of the actual uh, exact total number of tasks. So it's always over a specific time. It's never like we did, you know, we did a thousand tasks. Well, that's not useful information. How long did it take to do those? So a few scenarios where this might be important. Um, data center servers, say YouTube and, and Netflix, for example, they have terabytes of data coming out of their servers every second, basically. And so they really need to have the ability to, for the, you know, for their task, which is give the user the next five seconds of their video, they have to have a very high throughput, right? In a very, you know, very short amount of time, right? Um, high performance computing, also th this matters. Um, if you have like a distributed like cluster um, and there's a lot of data passing between 
nodes, you really need to be able to do that very, you, you need that um, throughput to be very high in those situations. Now, there's, there's kind of a problem though. Um, in general, latency improvements are not as like large as the, the improvements in bandwidth. So another way of saying this, bandwidth improvements are outpacing latency improvements across all of the main uh, computer technologies. Here's just a diagram of a few, right? Um, where we have memory, network, disk, microprocessor. And this line here represents what would, uh, would be a, a uh, basically one-to-one -one correspondence of latency improvements and bandwidth improvements. So this is a log scale again. Again, you know, it's not like latency improvements aren't like pretty good, right? They're still uh, going up at a, an exponential rate, but not as exponential as these guys. Um, so th there's there's kind of one main reason, right, for this. Um, bandwidth, you can kind of just solve those problems by just adding more of the thing that you don't have enough bandwidth of, right? If you're like, shoot, we don't have enough, uh, you know, we're having a hard time sending out enough, enough data to our customers, like on Netflix. Well, just buy like another 20 fiber lines or something, right? And then you've solved your problem. You can't really do that with like latency. Uh, you can't be like, let's just, you know, make the speed of light on our fiber lines faster. It's not gonna work. Um, the other, another factor here is that, um, you know, things are, it, it's, it's pretty difficult to actually parallel, parallelize. Um, for example, say you have a, a program you want to, to you know, um, to optimize the, the, the optimize and you want to get the latency down, you'd have to probably parallelize it across multiple cores, really annoying. Um, but if you just want to do more of that task, you just buy more computers. And then you have, they're still just as slow to complete a single task, but the amount that you, of tasks that you can perform is going to be larger. Okay. So here's a, here's an, application question for you. Say we have two processors. We have processor A, we have processor B, um, and we're talking about some application C, okay? Again, care about when we have an application. If we talk, if we, if we know that la the latency of finishing C on A um, is much smaller than that on B, is there anything that we can say about the bandwidth difference between the two? No, there's not. So, um, what happened? Yeah, L latency may have an effect on bandwidth, but it may it may not. There, there's there's many factors that can affect bandwidth um, that may even be adverse to to latency. Um, and I think that, so the, the next example here is going to show that this is the case. So let's just, let's just talk about, for example, 
uh, we, we, we just want to transmit a bunch of data. Um, and we want to look at the latency and the bandwidth of, of transmitting, transmitting it across, across land. So maybe the first thing that we might try is, is just get a fiber optic cable. Um, and we got to send, you know, what, like half a terabyte, pretty reasonable over a fiber connection. It's going to take, what is this? I don't know how many minutes that is. Not many. Um, that's good. But let's look at the bandwidth. So this is, again, uh, it, it's, it's the, the number of operations. In this case, it's the number of gigabytes that we've trans transferred um, over some time, which in this case is just seconds. That's what we get. But there's other ways. Yeah, go ahead. Do we differentiate between bandwidth and throughput in this course? Mm. Not really. Yeah, so fiber isn't the only way that you can get stuff across, uh, data across, like, a, you know, across, say, the nation, right? Uh, Andrew Tannenbaum has this quote that says, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurtling down the highway. And so let's just think about this, right? A few, I think we, that you can get like 20 terabytes now on a hard drive these days on a three and a uh, three and a half inch drive. So, you know, multiply this by another factor of, you know, four, five. Um, anyway, it's pretty light. You can put a bunch of these into a, a station wagon. You can put a, you know, you know, a, a ton of, a ton of these drives in and speed, you know, on, that's about how fast I go on, like through Utah. Um, and then your latency is going to be massive, right? Like this isn't like. You're going to be waiting a few days to get it from, you know, across across the country, for example. But your bandwidth, you know, it's it's pretty, it's also pretty bad, right? Um, but it's not it's not too bad. Um, so let's shove these same hard drives onto a supersonic bomber. Now it's going very fast. It's probably going much faster than this, honestly. You know, this is only like Mach one and a quarter ish. Um, but we can put a lot more on and our bandwidth is gonna start getting up comparable to, to, um, to that of fiber. The issue is just this latency. So if we don't care about latency, then it's totally fine. But if, if, um, you, know, if you do care about latency, you might be willing to, to, to use this and even though it has less bandwidth. Now, what if we did the same thing? We put all these hard drives on the uh, world's, world's largest tanker, sent it around the world at you know, 20 knots or so. Um, latency, ridiculous, right? This is gonna take, you know, they're gonna have to go from the West Coast through the Panama Canal around, very bad. But the bandwidth is huge, right? Um, like if you do the computations on this, you're going to be able to store like exabytes, I think, of data. And just for context, the entire internet is like in the petabytes range at this point. So bandwidth is ridiculous. So again, doing stuff like this is going to adversely affect your latency but your bandwidth is gonna increase dramatically. And so, you know, th these are very disconnected concepts. It, it may be, like I said, it may be the case that if you, if you, for example, reduce latency, your, your bandwidth will, and, and don't change anything else, your bandwidth is probably going up, but it's not, you know, that's, that's uh, um, you know, the, the inverse is not true. 
if you, your bandwidth has increased, it doesn't mean your latency has decreased. Okay, moving on to another metric. How about power? Or energy, right? Kind of the two. They're related, obviously, by a derivative. Um, and if you look at this diagram over here, right, like we have system B, which is, or system A, I guess, which has, which is this blue. And it has a lot spikier of a, a power uh, curve. Whereas system B, like, it's a lot more, you know, it, it doesn't have as, as low of lows and it doesn't have as high of highs. It's kind of like, uh, this is the blue one is what would happen without monetary policy. The red one is what happens with it. Okay, that joke didn't go anywhere. Anyway, um, maybe we care about the peak power, right? Your phone, you probably care about the peak power a little bit more than on your server, right? Because if your peak power on your phone is very high, you're going to like fry your hand. Or who cares if you, like it's in a server room? It's like, you know, chilled at 65 degrees, so it's totally fine. And it um, maybe though you care about, um, you know, for example, like not shorting out your circuits in your house or something, and then you might care about having a more con a lower peak power, but you're okay with having kind of a a higher total amount of energy that you're using. Okay, these are just some, again, it's all about trade-offs, right? It's not like, oh, this, this one's much worse than this one. It's all depending on your, your use case. And that's what we're going to find with pretty much everything in this class. Um, obviously, price, self-explanatory. Unless you're an Apple fan, then higher price is better. Okay, questions before we moved on to these derived metrics. And Zoom, just, just for your information, you guys can to totally just unmute yourself whenever if you have a question. Um, it's, it's, I have a question about throughput. Question about throughput. So, does that include everything that can happen in parallel or is it just uh, per processor? How does that work? Does what? that happen? Okay, so, so, so the question is, is that things that can happen in parallel or uh, just per processor? And with a lot of the questions in this class, and this one included, it's gonna be, it depends. It depends on how you're defining your uh, your throughput, right? If you care about a single core throughput, then you're going to only restrict it to a single core. Or if you care about just like a maybe higher level, um, you know, how many of this given task, who cares if it's parallelized or not, then it would be the whole system. So does that, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, th these metrics that we've talked about, right? they're useful to, to know about and but really what matters is being able to apply them to your specific use case you know if you can't do that then they're pretty they're just they're tools right right if you don't know how to use them to actually evaluate a system they're pretty useless okay let's move on to some derived metrics um oftentimes we care about more than one metric at once right like, for example, maybe we care about bandwidth per dollar. Um, this really matters in, in networking, for example. Like, we could totally increase the bandwidth, but maybe we would have to pay a couple million dollars to get another line dug in the ground through a, you know, big city or whatever um, to increase the bandwidth. So that's going to be expensive. Bandwidth per watt, pretty, pretty self-explanatory as well, right? Work per joule, so instructions per amount of power or energy. Um, in general, if you want to make a bigger is better metric, um, you're going to multiply by the bigger is better metric and divide by the smaller is better metric. Um, so obviously, 
if we have bigger bandwidth, that's better. So that's why we you know, would generally multiply by that. If we have less dollars, that's also better. So we divide. Um, and yeah, so you can kind of just make up metrics, right? Um, I'm not going to make up one on the fly, but you know, if you need another metric, you can kind of have this in the back of your mind of like, well, you just kind of derive your own. There are some metrics though where smaller is better. For example, cycles per instruction. So this is the number of clock cycles of your CPU per instruction um, that you uh, um, perform. Another one is latency times energy. Um, this is the energy delay product. We'll look at that in just a second. And in general, it's just the inverse, right? We multiply by the bigger, the smaller stuff, and we then divide by the bigger stuff, which kind of just makes sense, right? If we have, uh, um, if we, for example, have less cycles, um, or then that's going to be a good thing. Um, if we have um, uh, more instructions, that's going to be um, uh, um, what was it? Oh, where, where was going with this? We want we want to, uh, the like yeah. Anyway, this, this we want the we want the um, uh, cycles to be smaller. We want the instructions to be larger per the number of cycles. All right, so um, let's talk about this energy delay product. This is pertinent to systems like mobile devices where you kind of want to uh, balance your latency. So like your applications performance and such, your Candy Crush performance, for example, and the amount of energy that you're using. Um, because you, you know, your users are going to be really mad if they can't play Candy Crush for eight hours a day. So, um, you know, th this is, this, this metric is a way of kind of comparing, uh, these two, two things that we care about energy and latency. Um, and it's a smaller is better, right? Like if, if the if the energy delay product is smaller, then that's that's a good thing. We can also, you know, again, these are pretty arbitrary. If your use case is well, I really care about latency a lot more than energy. You can just be like, well, I'm going to use energy times delay squared instead. So now we're we're waiting we're waiting the delay, the latency a bit more. So. Um, Hopefully this example kind of shows you, yeah, we, if, if we need a new metric, just like make it, it's fine. Um, and this brings us to like, well, is there a right metric? The, the, the answer is no, right? There's no universally correct metric. For some people, you know, you might care about, uh, about and even even just in your own personal life, you probably care a lot more about, for example, the heat or, or you know the amount of energy that your phone is using than your desktop, right? Um, and we can just make up stuff, as I mentioned already, right? For example, let's how about just the latency for compiling the Linux kernel using GCC? That's a fine metric. Compiling Hello World in Rust, probably about the same as the first one. Um, frame per second for you know our, all of our favorite games right now, Cyberpunk 2077. Database transactions per second for dollar, right? Like just combine stuff as much as you want. Um, yeah, again, situ all entirely situational. What do you need to do? What constraints are you under? Um, and generally, like you don't have to like make up something really fancy. You can just combine what we've already discussed. For this class, though, 
we mainly care about performance. Uh, so latency or bandwidth is what we're going to be looking at primarily because you know the lucky thing for us is that people are willing to pay tons of money to decrease their latency or increase their bandwidth which is which is good so we don't you know somebody's going to buy it if we make it um okay how how do we compare different architectures then Uh, and this brings us to benchmarks. Um, there's lots of different benchmarks out there. Um, a benchmark is just a set of programs that are re representative of a larger set of problems. Um, so a few common ones for, for kind of um, the academic community, uh, server computing, you, you might use second, scientific computing, sec. FP, which is a floating point uh, um, benchmark. You know, if you're on mobile, you've probably heard of the Geekbench uh, like benchmark. Um, and we can argue of whether or not it's any good, but you know. There's no best one, obviously. Like um, again, the reason is it, it it's so situational. Um, like obviously you wouldn't want to run Geekbench on a on a supercomputer, right? Like that's there's no point. Um, and the other thing is it's only an approximation. You know, obviously the benchmark doesn't contain all software that could ever be run on your device. Um, so your actual real software performance is gonna gonna be different. Um, There are a few different kinds of benchmarks, though. So, so um, micro benchmarks. These are going to stress a single part of your system and evaluate, like, the performance of, say, your memory accesses, or um, uh, you know, some communication speed with, like, say, peripherals or something like that. Another type of benchmark is a kernel, um, and this basically is measuring the most compute intensive part of of um of an application so if you have like if you have a, a program that has a lot of features but at its core it's just going to do matrix multiplication for example a kernel would just do the matrix multiplication without all the random other like input stuff and everything around it and then the last kind is a full application benchmark which measures the performance of an entire application um, and this is i think generally one of the more common common ones um, at least as far as you know like pretty much all of the um hmm, i don't know it, again there there's plenty of benchmarks of all all these kinds but spec and the spec fp are these latter ones obviously there's stuff for databases servers hmm. graphics everything graph processing and so here's here's just a list of the programs or some of the programs that compose specint from 2006 i think they've obviously updated it but you know whatever it still proves the point um, so we have we have Perl, some compression algorithm, GCC. You know we have some AIs, um, video compression, uh, discrete event simulation. I don't know about you guys, but I don't run any of these programs besides GCC on a regular basis, pretty much. So it's it's not really representative of, for example, what I do on my computer. But if I was more into stuff like, you know, along these lines, then it, it might be, it might approximate it even better. And quite frankly, the thing about it is these are varied enough that, you know, it's, it's probably decently representative anyway. Um, but yeah, obviously, these aren't all the different problems that you can solve on a computer. 
like for example, they don't have any, another thing is like, this is all C, C++, they don't have anything in an interpreted language. They don't have any JavaScript, which would make everything worse probably. Anyway, in spite of its flaws though, right? Um, it gives us a good trend line and that's what we really care about. Um, and, and this is, by the way, one of my qualms with like all these reporters of like mobile devices that are like, oh, it's beating the crap out of the previous generation. I'm like, is it really? Like maybe it's just really good at this bench benchmark in particular. Like um, the trend line is what we really, really care about though. And as you can see, obviously, you know, um, you know, these are different, different versions of, of the benchmark, but you know, you, the trend line is going up. Okay. Let's talk about the CPU performance equation. So the problem that we have is we kind of like a model to help us understand how our choices in computer architecture affect our performance, in this case, latency. And we're going to do that in terms of three different parameters. The first is instruction count. This is the total number of instructions that the CPU executes. Okay. Cycles per instruction is just going to be the number of uh, cycles um, required to execute the, uh, the number of instructions that your entire program is, right? Like your entire program execution. Um, the key is it is a ratio. So this is, a, this is gonna be an average. It's gonna be a weighted average um, of like your total number of cycles over the total number of instructions executed. Um, cycle time is just the length of a clock cycle in seconds. Okay, so these are the three parameters that we care about. We just multiply them together. And if you do the dimensional analysis, you realize that you're gonna end up with seconds being the only thing not canceled out. And that's going to be your, your latency. Um, and this is a model, right? So we can do stuff like approximate it. We can, we can be like, eh, let's just approximate cycles for instructions, for example. Or we can approximate instruction count as well. Um, and th these are going to be useful tools for us um, as, we, as we go on. Um, but again, if you, if you have a total and absolute, absolutely precise understanding of the instruction count for your application on the CPU, the cycles for instructions for this application on your CPU and the exact cycle time, then you will, you know, this will correctly get, uh, give, uh, oh, I keep shocking it and it's like spazzes out on the, on the projector. Um, it'll give you the actual latency. Okay. Um, again, it, it's a model, um, but it does model like reality. So that's good. Um, latency is linearly uh, changing with all three of these parameters. So instruction counts, CPI cycles for instruction and the clock time. So that's the, the seconds per cycle. And it should be fairly clear, right? If we increase any of these, it's going to increase latency. And if we decrease any of those, it's going to decrease latency. Um, obviously leaving the other two alone, right? So what we, another thing that it can do though, is let's just say we have an opportunity to reduce one metric. For example, uh, if we're able to reduce clock time by 50%, um, but we um, increase the CPI by, by two. So two more cycles per instruction. 
it's probably going to give us a net win um, if the CPI was originally greater than two in the original system, right? Um, because effectively the the you know the extra two two cycles for instruction is going to be offset by the increase in clock speed. Okay. Uh, is there let's see. any questions before we talk about ways of actually accomplishing these 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 three goals? Okay, so cycle time. How do we reduce it? Um, so it's a function of processor design. Um, so if we have to do less stuff per cycle, the cycle time is going to be shorter. Um, we'll kind of revisit this when we talk about pipelining. But it's also a function of process technology. And by process technology, this is basically like the, the technology um, used to actually create the, the chip itself. If we have a more advanced process, you know, we, we might be able to increase clock speed. Uh, for example, the reason why Intel is getting their pan speed off of them right now is because they're still on 14 nanometer and are coming down to 10. Uh, and AMD is at five. Or I think they're at, like they're going down to five um, pretty soon. I think they're at six or seven now. So, you know, you can just do a lot more if you have better process technology. Um, you know, clock rates, you know, they're not like that much better, but they're, they're, they are actually beating Intel on single core, per, 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 single core performance for the first time in a long time, which is, which is really good. Go team red. Um, the issue, um, the reason why we actually aren't seeing as much uh, improvement in, in clock rates just from advanced, more advanced process technology is power, right? You just can't shove enough power through these things without making them really be on fire. Um, another thing is manufacturing variation. You might have a really good process, but if it's unreliable, you're gonna have some problems, right? Um, it might, there might be manufacturer defects um, and, and manufacturers will, will just bin individual CPUs by how fast they will run. And then they'll sell them, oh, this one's a little bit slower than, the, than it should be. It's an i5 instead of an i7 now. Um, and again, yeah, the more you pay, it's gonna be faster. And there, there's, there was back in the day, they had such a good, so like they assume a, a certain rate of failure per, per like uh, core, right? Or per, per CPU. And so for a, there was a time that with some particular CPUs, right, where they were like, they were getting too many good ones. So they just ended up selling the, the good ones as lower tier. And just in, so, in like the, the CPU firmware disabled the extra core. And if you were smart, you would buy one and just re-enable it. Anyway, it, it was kind of, it's kind of interesting that that, um, that was a thing. And it, I'm sure it still is in, in, some, in some cases. Okay, so real quick, um, you might not really be familiar or with, with thinking about things in terms of um, uh, seconds per cycle, right? Because this is a smaller is, is better metric. Um, we, we want less seconds to do one cycle. Um, you might hear clock speed, like your, your gigahertz, um, a lot more. And the reason is pretty simple. Consumers like bigger is better. Right? Nobody is going to go buy another computer because they're like, we reduced our, our seconds per cycle from uh, 0.01 nanoseconds to 0.0, uh, you know, 0.09 
nanoseconds. Nobody cares. But if you say that you've increased your gigahertz by like 0.4 or 0.1, everyone's going to flock to it. Um, and yeah, it's measured in hertz, which is the inverse, you, you know. Um, and yeah, most of the time, because we're dealing at such fast clock um, speeds, obviously we're going to have some metric prefix on it because I don't want to have to write a bunch of zeros. Okay, uh, and I mean, I'm not going to go through this example. I think it's relatively self explanatory. Um, so if you if you substitute this this other formulation in here, then you get this latency is just your um, uh, instruction count, cycles per instruction, and then divide by by your clock speed. Okay. Um, another thing that's important. Uh, to know about is this instruction count. Um, there's two instruction counts that you might care about. First of all, is the first one is the dynamic instruction count. This is the number of instructions that the program executes at runtime. For example, you ran a program with a particular input and it executed 1 million instructions and then exited it. That's your dynamic instruction count. The static instruction count is the number of instructions in the compiled code. Um, and that's proportional to, to your binary size and you know stuff like that. You know, maybe you're really have a really simple program and it produced 10 static instructions when you compiled it. Okay. We don't care about static. That's something that like maybe compilers people care about if they care about binary size, but I, I don't know anybody anymore who cares about binary size as evidenced by the fact that Electron exists and Rust exists. So um, the dynamic one is the one that we care about. So let's talk about how we can reduce this then. Obviously, there's many different ways that we can like do the same task, and you know we can uh, make algorithmic improvements. This is you know your algorithms class. We can do compiler optimizations. You know, just add more numbers to the end of your dash o when you pass it to GCC, for example. You could take advanced high performance computing with Bo Wu next semester and learn even more techniques to, to do this. There are many ways of um, improving, improving this. Um, so if we are able to reduce the number of dynamic instructions, assuming that we have the same CPI and the clock speed is the same, we're going to end up with a faster uh, execution. Um, so yeah, if we have if we have a X percentage reduction, then you're going to get a speed up of old, let's just say it's one, and the new is just going to be one minus however much that percentage is. Um, you know, this is obviously just a conversion of percentage to, to decimal. And that's our speed up. So if we have a 20% reduction in instruction count, we can plug that in. We get uh, 1 over 0.8, which is a 1, 1 1.25 times speed up. OK. Um, there's some other factors that impact instruction count. 
So obviously the program that we execute is going to change the number of instructions that get executed. That's hopefully relatively self-explanatory. But um, the input can also determine the number of instructions that get executed. Let's just say we're GCC and we're trying to compile a program. If we have to compile a 1,000 line program versus a 100 line program, it's going to execute more instructions on that parse step, especially and parse and lex. Um, and, and definitely, you know, once you get the AST as well, it's going to have more stuff to do with it. It'll have more things that it'll have to optimize. Um, another thing that might affect it is that um, we, we might have to compile for different instruction set architectures. If you're compiling for x86, you're lucky, or maybe unlucky, I don't know, that you have a floating point square root instruction. But in MIPS, yeah, good luck. No, you're going to have to do that yourself. Um, I'm sure you remember from comp.org having to do something, you know, I don't know if it was square root, but it, it's enough MIPS for, for my for my career, in my opinion. In order to make a meaningful comparison, though, so, so this, you know, we care about comparing things like this, 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 this uh, CPU performance equation gives us the performance of a specific computer, but we normally compare, care about comparing, right? We need each computer to do the same amount of work. Um, they may have a different number of instructions because they're a different compiler or a different instruction set architecture or, you know, whatever, but they have to be doing the same task on the same input for it to be at all meaningful. Okay, so let's talk about CPI. This is the second term in this equation. Oh, any questions? Looks like we aren't going to get too much of the worksheet, but just bring it next time. Um, this is the most complex of the terms. This is where like all the complexity comes in. It depends on a lot of things. The compiler, the input, the processor design, the memory system, like everything. It is not the number of cycles required to execute one instruction because each instruction is different. And it is, however, the ratio of the number of cycles required to execute the program and that program's instruction count. It's an average. Um, it may be useful maybe to think about one over CPI, so instructions per cycle, IPC. Um, maybe it's a bit more intuitive because it, it does emphasize that it's an average. Um, but you know, either way. Just remember, we have to care about an average. Which leads us to the first problem, which is basically, what is your CPI of this, this, um, this machine? And I'll give you a hint, it's a weighted average. So I don't know, maybe, maybe that is uh, fairly self-evident as well. So I'll give you like just a minute to do that computation. I'll switch over to my how do I do this? We'll see how this works. Oh shoot, this isn't gonna work. Um, hmm. Well, I'll just copy this over. Okay, 10% uh, floating point at 11 cycles. So this is our cap, three. This is our first term, right? Then since it is a weighted average, um, I'll figure out a better solution for this next time. 0.2 times your 50 cycles from memory. Um, Next term, this 0.2 times that 50. Then you do the same thing with uh, um, branch and jump instructions. 
Um, and you get plus four, five, and then oh, let me just add the extra term here. Um, one, oh, point three, I guess, for the last one. Um, and that's two. Okay, so let me move that over. Run the numbers. I think you should get. 13.7. Yeah, okay. Let me just do this. Um, so yeah, that's all it is. The problem is it's not that simple because, well, for now it's that simple. The issue is that memory operations are going to become more complicated once we talk about cache. And branch instructions are going to be more complicated once we talk about branch prediction. So it's going to get worse from here, not better. Sorry to disappoint. Um, yeah, so we're, we're definitely making a few simplifying instructions or simplifying assumptions. Um, okay, as far as the, okay, let me take a pause real quick and talk about how, how you'll submit the worksheet. You won't submit it this week because we aren't finishing uh, the worksheet today. But next week, what you'll do is you'll just go up and like upload a PDF to Gradescope. Um, there's instructions on the website of, diff of a couple of options that you have for diff for Mac and, and are not Mac, like your, your Android or iOS. Um, and then you can just like upload that PDF. It's the, gonna, it's the first time that we're doing this. So if you have troubles, just let me know and we can, we can figure something out. Um, again, you won't have to worry about it this week. I'll, I'll change the, the schedule to reflect that. Um, let's see, do I? Yeah, okay, so there's a few things that um, uh, that affect the CPI. One of them is instruction mix. So we have, you know, if we if our program does a lot of integer operations, then the weight, as we saw from from that computation just a minute ago, of the ALU operations, are going is going to be higher, right? Um, if we do a bunch of floating point, then obviously the weight of that is going to be higher. And the compiler actually has some flexibility in which instructions it chooses. Um, for example, if you want to multiply by two, you can either use a multiply instruction that's going to take five cycles or something, or you can just binary shift and, and call it good. The binary shift is just going to be one cycle. Um, and, and then the CPI then is just the ratio of, is just the weighted average, right? As we saw in the previous one of the entire Programs instruction mix, um, and here's just two two um, uh, examples. Spec int obviously has a lot more integer operations. You know, it still has memory and branch stuff. Um, spec fp, which is floating point, has a lot more floating point, but it also has a bunch of integer stuff. It has memory things, branch as well. So you're going to end up with a different, even if you have like the same number of total instructions in both of these um, benchmarks, you're going to end up with a, a, a very different CPI um, because this floating point is just going to like screw you over. Um, yeah, compiler people, they can care about selecting which one to use. Um, and it also, 
the the one thing that we I guess would have to care about though on our side is given our ISA how many cycles is it going to take to perform each one of those operations um, generally if it's an integer operation it's going to be uh, pretty pretty simple whereas a multiplication maybe going to be more complex etc these are just for the Intel Intel's processor from like a long time ago um, I couldn't find updated numbers so okay that's it for today go ahead and just keep your worksheet bring it back next week we'll finish that and i will see you next monday thanks guys thank you sumner mm -hmm. So Sumner, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, quick question. Um, so you mentioned that the clock rate improvements would take a lot of power um, and it was hard to do on the small chip, but you said that the, it would be easier to do a, to improve the, what was it? The, the, to reduce the clock time or the time per like per clock. But aren't those just inverses of each other? um i don't think i if i did say that i misspoke okay it was on that slide where you were saying like um cycles per time does this 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 and then it, it said clock rate i'll show you um, yeah this one no no keep going this one so you said, oh crap, what did I do? Okay, yeah. She so said clock rates aren't increasing much due to power problems. But mm -hmm. um but is, is is the clock rate just the inverse of cycle time? Uh yes. So we want so so cycle time is is your uh uh time required per cycle yeah seconds over cycle right yeah um clock rate obviously is, is the inverse so okay because clock rates you, you can substitute this and say however cycle time isn't increasing much due to power problems that would be okay okay thing. okay i thought okay that sense? yeah i must have heard like some like unrealistic example where you said we can improve cycle time and just assume that we okay so it's hard to improve cycle time and it, clock it rate. It's pretty hard to improve cycle time. Like it's still okay. possible, but it's not increasing at a super fast rate. It's increasing reasonably, but but not okay. exponentially. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Appreciate it. Cool. Uh, I think you're the last one. So I'm gonna end the in the meeting. Yeah, you're good. You're good. See you next week. Have a good one. You too.